So in this lecture, we're going to be discussing Roman historiography. So one thing we have to kind of uh, understand to understand how Roman historiography works is to have a very brief overview of Roman political history. So originally, in a sense, the Romans were ruled by kings. And the story goes that the kings were tyrants and that one of the king's uh, sons was so arrogant that he raped the uh, wife of a noble, a Roman noble, the uh, a woman named Lucretia. And Lucretia then uh, committed suicide, uh, but not before telling people what had happened to her and basically demanding vengeance. The Romans then not only exacted vengeance on the rapist, but actually overthrew the kings and made an oath that they would never be ruled by a king again. So in a sense, the Romans are saying, not only do we not like this king, we don't like any kings. Kings are by nature tyrants. And this leads to the establishment of a republic. Right, so they go from having a kind of monarchy to having a republic. Now, the republic was very successful and would expand out not simply from the city of Rome and the Italian peninsula, but also conquer large parts of Europe and even North Africa. So the republic was very successful and in fact became an empire. Now, the word empire can, be, can mean kind of two different things. One is that it is a government ruled by an emperor, which makes sense, but it can also mean controlling territories outside your homeland, right? Controlling territories uh, that initially belong to people who are different than you culturally and linguistically. So when I say empire, I mean that second one. I mean that we have a republic that controls people who are different, right? Linguistically, religiously, culturally, ethnically, however you want to put it. And Romans were quite, uh, in the Republic, were quite proud of their multi-ethnic, their diverse empire. So the Republic is very successful. It does go out and expand. However, what ends up happening uh, for various reasons that I discuss when I teach History 121 and 122, or I'm sorry, just History 121, and uh, that if you took uh, uh, Western Civ, you would have also studied, um, the Republic falls apart in a sense. It's divided by civil wars an attempt to reunify, to bring back uh, unity to the empire. Uh, there's a dictatorship, most famously the one led by Julius Caesar, pictured here. Um, the dictatorship, uh, because he's becoming a dictator, he seems to be becoming a king. A group of senators uh, led by Brutus are going to assassinate Julius Caesar. Um, in order to save the Republic, it doesn't save the Republic, and the Republic will fall apart and be replaced by rule by emperors. So basically, there's this understanding this Republic doesn't work. We need one really strong, powerful person to hold things together. And the man who would become, in a sense, this first emperor would be Caesar's nephew slash adopted son. It was common in uh, many cultures, in fact, that if you didn't have sons, like Julius Caesar had a daughter but no son, um, you would adopt a nephew, so you, someone from your own family, your own extended family, to be your son. Uh, so Caesar adopted a man named Octavian, who would take the name Caesar Augustus. He knew what he was doing and was able to successfully defeat the people who opposed him. He continued Caesar's legacy and was able to become the first emperor of Rome though he never, of course, declared himself a king. You weren't supposed to have kings if you were Roman. And he presented himself as the first citizen, in a sense. So it kind of kept this language of republic. But now we have a change in government. We have a Rome ruled by emperors. A Roman empire ruled by emperors. And, of course, here I mean empire to mean both uh, definitions of the word empire, right? Can mean rule by emperor, we've got that, but also rule by, of over people very different from yourself, and we've got that too. And the empire is going really well during the time of uh, Octavius, uh, Caesar Augustus, going really well, it gets even bigger. So now I've given you that kind of overview of Roman history, political history, I can now talk to you about some of the authors who you're going to be reading about. 
And the first is a man named Polybius. So Polybius, you'll notice the years. Uh, C here means circa. He is living during the time when Rome is still a republic, and the republic's doing well, really well, and it's expanding. But he is interesting. He was Greek. So he's going to be part of the Roman Empire. He was, um, he's going to live in the Roman Empire. His people will be conquered by the Romans. But that's okay in a sense because Rome is a self-consciously multi-ethnic empire, right? So he's still in a sense Roman, but he has a Greek background. He speaks Greek. Um, and like I said, he is writing when the Roman Republic is doing really well, when things are going great. And of course, that's going to shape his understanding of writing, especially there's this kind of question, why did the Romans beat us? <laughs> you know, why did we lose to them? And you're reading what is actually dealing with that subject. So he actually became a hostage of the Romans uh, when they defeated his city. And so he would go live in Rome. And while he was there, um, here's the thing about Rome. They have a very strong admiration for Greek culture. The Roman gods, for example, basically are just copies of the Greek gods. Um, and uh, the Romans thought Greece was really amazing. They loved Greek philosophy, Greek ideas, the Greek language, and things like that. They, the Romans were not ashamed to learn from other people. And because of this, Polybius was able to mix with a lot of people in Rome, would become a tutor, would teach people. So even though he was a hostage uh, for a long time, he actually enjoyed a lot of freedom. Uh, and that would give him the opportunity to, to write. And he's going to write a history talking about the rise of the Roman Empire while it was still a republic. And in particular, he was interested in the constitution of the Roman state. Uh, Greeks uh, were very interested in political philosophy and trying to understand what was the best form of government. And he would be very interested in that. So that is going to be the first historian that we're going to kind of talk about. And there's a couple quotes from him that I think are really cool I want to share with you. Uh, Plebius wrote, What is really educational and beneficial to students of history is the clear view of the causes of events. So I have a question, why did something happen? Right, that's one of the fundamental questions that historians ask. Why did something happen? Why did it happen now uh, at this time period rather than a different time period? Why did it happen at this time rather than earlier or later? And then once we understand the cause, you can see a second idea, and the consequent power of choosing the better policy in a particular case. If we understand that A causes B, and B is something we want, then we should do A. On the other hand, if uh, B is something we don't want, we should not do A. Right? That's kind of the basic learning um, what history can teach us. Now, one thing also that we need to acknowledge about Polybius is that he's doing something different from that, like Herodotus and a lot of the Greek historians. So let's, let's look at another quote. By far the greater number of historians concern, concern themselves with isolated wars and the incidents that accompany them. While as to a general and comprehensive scheme of events, their date, origin, catastrophe, no one as far as I know has undertaken to examine it. So for the most part, historians, the Greek historians, focused on a particular style or particular point in time. So, for example, Herodotus focused on the wars with Persia. Uh, Thucydides, who we didn't really talk about, but who's another important historical Greek figure, focused more on the battles and the wars between Sparta and Athens. Polybius is influenced by them, or he's a Greek, but he's going to start thinking about something more comprehensive, telling a bigger, wider history. Greeks were more concerned about these smaller scale wars. Or I should say small scale wars, but by, you know, a single war or series of wars. Or um, the history of their city state. But Rome is a multi-ethnic empire that has listed a long time and unites all these different groups of people. And so it forces you to really think more deeply about all these different groups of people and this very, very complex situation. So you see some real development beginning with Polybius in this effort to expand the scope and write a comprehensive history. Another, in a sense, a story you're going to look at, and I think this shows the connection of history and politics, is someone who wrote what we could maybe call contemporary history, uh, Julius Caesar. Right There's Julius Caesar pictured there. We talked about how he 
is going to be um, killed um, by uh, by Brutus and the other senators who thought they could save the Republic that way. His power base came from his success as a military governor in Gaul, which is like modern day France, and his conquests there in some other areas. And he wanted to make sure everyone knew about his conquests, so he wrote something called the Gallic Wars, starring Julius Caesar. Right, so Caesar is going to talk and write about history in a way that in many ways is true, is authentic, but is also designed to advance his political interests. And that's something we're going to see constantly, is that there is a connection between history and politics, between history and power. But that um, is going to be something you'll be reading an excerpt from to try and understand how he tells history in a way that serves his political purposes. Another historian we'll look at is Livy. And you can see what I was talking about with Polybius and this idea of writing more broad history, comprehensive history. Julius Caesar wasn't doing that. He was just writing the history of himself. Livy is going to try and write the history of Rome. Right? He's going to write the history of Rome. That's a pretty big history. And we can kind of, and this again is where years are important. Usually I'm not too strict on asking people to memorize dates. Um, and I'm not going to ask you to memorize these years. But I do want you to know the period that we're dealing with. This is the period when the Republic is falling apart, when there's civil wars. And then when he dies, this is a few years after um, Octavian, Augustus Caesar, has become the first emperor and is starting to get Rome back on track. So, of course, that's going to shape his understanding of what's going on, right? Livy's going to have this question, why did things go wrong with the Republic? And why did we have this present system, right? And I think Livy kind of misses the Republic. Even though um, it was falling apart, he sees it as kind of an ideal time. And so he, even though in one sense also he was close to Augustus and his family, he doesn't want to criticize Augustus. He does have this kind of question, you know, how did we move from being this group of people who did not like monarchy to having a system of government? It's kind of like monarchy. And so you'll read an excerpt from his um, history of Rome. Another very important Roman historian is a man named Tacitus, right? And I chose these two images on purpose this is from the 15th century. Uh, so Europeans in the 15th century uh, were reading Tacitus. They were reading all these people. And so the Romans, and I want to stress Europeans, strongly connected with Roman civilization. Many Europeans, uh, especially the people who would have written this, lived in the Holy Roman Empire, which called itself the Holy Roman Empire, because it tried to connect itself to Rome. And this is a more modern statue of Tacitus in Austria. But Tacitus is going to write two major works, the Annals and the Histories, in which he is also going to take this very comprehensive view of Roman history. So again, we had this shift to the broad view. In a sense, Roman historians are becoming more Chinese. You remember Shima Chan was very interested in this broad view of things. But Tacitus, again, you'll notice the years, he's living after Augustus Caesar. He's living, in a sense, during a time when there were some actually pretty rotten emperors like Nero. I think he also lived during Caligula's reign. So he's going to look at history, and I know the title there is History and Morality. He's going to try and look at history in order to figure out how can we be more moral? And in a sense, he's a lot like Shima Chan because Shima Chan connected morality to political success. We want to be moral because by being moral, we can achieve political success. Okay, I'm Tacitus. I'm living during a time during some bad emperors. What can we do to avoid those bad emperors' habits, their immorality, so we can have moral emperors, so we can have a stable political system, a stable society? So that's something he's very interested in. Similarly, the last of the Roman historians we'll be looking at is a man named Plutarch. And again, uh, these are both images from what's called the Nuremberg Chronicle, which is a late 15th century work in Europe. So again, you can see how important um, the Romans were 
to uh, Europeans in the 15th century when printing presses had just been developed, they were creating um, new editions of their works so they could be read more closely. And of course, it's important to note, Roman, the Western Europe, the Holy Roman Empire, Latin was a um, language of learning, so educated Europeans could read this in the original Latin. But Plutarch is interesting uh, because he is going to focus on biography. So he tells the stories of the lives of important people with, uh, from history in order, again, to bring out moral lessons. But this morality is focused on how do we build a stable political and social world, right? How do we bring stability by being moral? Now, the reason it's called parallel lives is because what Plutarch did, and I think this is really cool, was a lot of the time what he did was he would choose a Greek, famous Greek person and write a biography. And then he would choose a similar Roman person and write a biography to show how they were similar. To show that, hey, we Romans are just as good as those Greeks. Right? They maybe came first in some ways and they had some really awesome people, but we Romans can do it too. So there's this interesting tension, I think, between Roman cosmopolitanism, respecting people um, outside of Rome, but also trying to say, we're just as good as them. But again, like I said, he was thinking a lot about morality, but in terms of how do we be moral in order to build a good political system, a good government, and a good society.